Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Stephen Dast. I'm a uh, Game Crafter sanity tester. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about sanity testing uh, a little bit later at the end of my brother's talk. Uh, if you don't know at all what sanity testing is, um, we basically uh, read rules and provide feedback uh, uh, through the Game Crafter. Um, so, um, uh, we've been doing sanity tests for about a year and a half now. Um, and before I did sanity tests, I was kind of the uh, game collector for our, our gaming group. So I would buy the games, I would read the rules, I would teach the games. And so I've read a lot of rules uh, uh, over the years. Um, and what I've noticed in doing the sanity tests is there are, I'm going to say, three main areas where uh, rules written on the game crafter seem to be uh, missing an opportunity, um, uh, not up to kind of what I see in the uh, game store games that I pick up. And those areas are kind of the introductory material, the first three sections that you'd like to see in a, in a set of rules. So the introduction, the overview, the list of components are what I'm going to be talking about. Um, all you need to enjoy this presentation is uh, one speaker. Hi. Um, we're going to go through just a handful of slides. We don't have a, a whole lot of time to, for these talks. Uh, so I'm going to show some examples from published uh, games. Uh, and naturally, in a presentation such as this, there will be some uh, text-only slides that you'll, you can nap through those or use them to catch up or, or anything else that you'd like to do. Uh, before I get caught up too much in a spiral of self-reference and, uh, and confusion, I'll just uh, go ahead and get started with what I'm calling the three biggest missed opportunities in rules writing. And the first of these is the introduction. So the introduction for your game should establish the thematic foundation. So kind of in the, in the fantasy world of your game, what are the players? Who are the players? Uh, what are they doing in the game? Where does the game take place? Where are the events uh, uh, taking place? What's at stake for the players? What's going on in the game world that they want to win? Um, so this is kind of your opportunity to establish that story, the story that your game is based on. Uh, and you do have a lot of flexibility here because you're kind of, this is your imagination uh, uh, part of what the game is about. Um, at this point, you don't have to be explaining anything specific about the game. In fact, you should avoid explaining anything too specific about the game. Um, Here's a good example, the Manhattan Project. Uh, the game starts when a revolutionary technology is discovered. Um, the second paragraph here, you are, you the player are the leader of a great nation's atomic weapons program. So you're gonna be leading a weapons program. Uh, hopefully you will get through and, and lead your nation to victory rather than being crushed by the indomitable might of your opponents. Uh, this gives you kind of uh, a mindset to get into. Um, what sort of decisions am I going to be making? Uh, this one's all right. Uh, if you like the storytelling aspect of games, uh, then you might want to have an introduction that kind of tells a little story, that actually engages with that storytelling uh, itch. Uh, that some gamers and some game designers like to take advantage of. Um, so Euphoria by Stonemeyer Games tells a story about, as you read the story, you discover this is somebody who's growing up in sort of a futuristic, thought it was a utopia, but actually it's a dystopia. Uh, and so by telling that as a story, uh, you kind of engage that. You're, you're already putting people into the framework uh, of that game as, they're, as you're reading it. If you really want to do that, uh, and I don't know if you're actually going to be able to read that, especially if you're far back. Um, this is a Belfort, the beginning of the Belfort rules. The introduction is actually phrased as a letter from uh, the deputy assistant to the deputy assistant of the department of such and such to the players who are architects who have accidentally been assigned to a city 
There was only supposed to be one architect assigned to build this city, but now there are three to five architects. And of course, there can only be one key to the city handed out. Uh, so you guys are just going to have to work that much harder to make sure that you're the one who's getting the key to the city. Um, the introduction doesn't necessarily have to put the player, doesn't necessarily have to give a role to the player uh, in a game that's sort of a historically based game. Uh, you might want to just provide some background as to when the game takes place, what's going on in the world of the game. Uh, and so in the game 1812, The Invasion of Canada, doesn't put the players in the introduction. It tells information about what was going on in America in 1812. Why did we happen to try and invade Canada? Um, uh, just to give some background, give an idea as to what's going on in the game. Um, what you're really doing here is taking advantage of what we know about the world in order to kind of gently provide a framework uh, for how your game is going to work. Um, cognitive scientists will tell us that anytime we enter an interaction in the real world, we almost always have an idea about how that interaction is going to go. Uh, and that allows you to kind of know that if you walk into a fast food restaurant, you're not going to wait by the door to be seated at a table where someone will bring you a menu. That's what happens at a fancy sit-down restaurant. Um, and so if you can find a theme that uh, helps the players to understand the sorts of decision, what's going to be happening uh, in your game, what sort of activities, real-world activities you're modeling in your game, uh, that's going to make the rules, the, the actual rules of the game, that much easier to follow when you get to them because your reader is going to be able to attach them to some concepts that they already have. Now, not every game has a theme and so not every game is going to need an introduction. Uh, but any game can still have an introduction. So even if you have an abstract game that's you know, placing stones on a grid of boards or, well, what do I know? Um, you can still make up an introduction uh, tell a story about where this game is played, who plays it, and uh, uh, what the stakes are in that world where this game comes from. Uh, so the game Teach You, are you familiar with the game Teach You? Uh, it's basically a card game. It's played with a, a 52 card regular deck of cards with four special cards in it. Uh, there's nothing that exotic about it. Uh, but the designer in the rules, the introduction is this kind of obscure story that suggests uh, an academic trip to uh, China where uh, they see everywhere, people are playing this game everywhere, and they talk to their very wise uh, guide, and he says, no, I can't, these, the rules can't be explained. Um, so uh, a lot of times kind of the, the introduction should be really easy to write because you don't have to have anything specific in there. You don't have to teach any specific thing. You have a lot of flexibility. Um, and so the missed opportunity there is take advantage of that flexibility to do something fun. Uh, try and get your, your readers excited about playing your game. Um, don't just gloss over the, uh, uh, the introduction with a, okay, you're in a race, you're driving really fast cars, whoever makes it to the finish line first wins. Um, do, something, do something that'll make your, your, your players excited about it. Uh, the second big missed opportunity is the overview. Uh, the overview is generally you're switching from your imaginary uh, theme of the game to, okay, this is very specifically, this is what's happening in the game. This is what the players are actually doing, how the game works. What are the players actually trying to do? Uh, and how do your players get there? Uh, so if you've read about how to teach a game, uh, common advice is start with the goal. Uh, you're playing for points. You're trying to be the first to reach uh, the end of the track. You're trying to totally destroy uh, your opponent's armies. 
Um, so uh, this should be not just what is the goal, but what is the goal, how do you get there, and kind of what are the main activities of the game? Are you playing cards? Are you rolling dice? Are you moving things around on a board? Um, here's an example from uh, Splendor. Uh, it's very short. Uh, it talks about taking tokens, buying things. Um, as you buy things, you get certain advantages. Uh, the other thing I'll point out here is that your introduction, your overview, doesn't even necessarily have to be completely accurate. Uh, the Splendor overview talks about uh, as soon as a player reaches 15 prestige points, the current turn ends, and the player with the most prestige points is the winner. That's not technically true. In Splendor, you actually play to the end of the round. But by the time you get to that rule, this isn't going to be sitting in your head and thinking, that's not right. That's, they told me something different. This is really only here to give you the sense of the game. Um, Tasty Minstrel Games is really the uh, uh, experts on providing overviews. And again, I, this is pretty small. I don't know if you can uh, read it. Um, but it is a really fairly detailed discussion about what is going to be happening in the game. The game spans five rounds. At the beginning of the round, you're going to plan your, your turn with movement cards. Uh, once all the planning is done, you're going to reveal movement cards, you're going to move, you're going to take an action, um, list several of the actions that you might take. Once you've read this overview, you have a pretty good idea of how the game works. Uh, if you had played this before, but it had been a while and you wanted to refresh yourself, reading this overview would <clears throat> help to remind you, do a pretty good job of reminding you of how everything works, so you could sit down, uh, maybe check a few of the actual rules for details. Uh, but you could read through this and you'd say, oh yeah, that's, that's right, that's how this works. I, I remember that. Um, this does one other thing. Uh, it provides you with the high level picture of how the game is going to work, so that when you get to the actual rules, uh, you're not sitting there trying to figure out okay, what is this rule trying to, trying to get at? Uh, your rules kind of need to be a very low level procedural information, detailed information about step by step, how do you play the game? Uh, and it's a little bit like the blind men who are examining the elephant and trying to figure out what sort of creature they're looking at. If you only have that close up detail view, uh, you aren't necessarily going to immediately understand what that creature is, what am I figuring out? And so if you try to just explain the process for programming a turn's worth of movement and you didn't know that you were looking at the process for programming a turn's worth of movement, you might say, okay, I'm taking cards, I'm putting them face down on the table in a row. Oh, you don't want your rules to have an aha moment. You want your rules to be very clear so that when I'm reading a section, uh, and when I'm reading a procedure, I know exactly what that procedure is supposed to do uh, and what its place in the game is. Uh, the other thing this does for you is once I get to the rules proper, having read this, I kind of know what all I'm going to have to trudge through in the rules before I understand the full game. So I'm going to need to know how to the program uh, how to program the turn, what are these actions that I get to take, um, how am I picking up goods and delivering them, uh, and you know, how is the greatest shipping network actually determined. Um, the final big missed opportunity is in the list of components. Um, so, I mean, obviously we know what a list of components is. Uh, it's the stuff that comes with the game. Uh, in some cases, if players need to provide their own components or paper and pen to keep score with, that should also be listed in the, in the list of components. Uh, the opportunities here are to go ahead and not just say, hey, there's 20 wooden cubes in my game, five dice and uh, 64 tokens. Uh, actually say what those are in thematic terms. 
Um, so I don't have wooden cubes, I have resources. Um, I don't have tokens, I have status markers. Um, and so that way when you're writing the actual rules, you're able to make use of those thematic references uh, in your rules and so that helps to tie the theme together with, with the rules themselves and helps to reiterate uh, the information, kind of that framework that you have uh, established in your, in your introduction. Um, so uh, here's an example, the Dead Men Tell No Tales. This is just a part of their uh, component sheet, but uh, each thing has a name. So 24 fire dice. Uh, this is also good because I see that I'm saying fire dice. Yeah, I want to play with fire dice. Um, your double-sided uh, tokens identify themselves. You've got treasures, you're going to have guards, you're going to have crews, uh, you're going to find some trap doors on this, uh, on this expedition. Uh, pirate figures, the 30 deckhands are also described not only with their thematic identification, deckhands, but also descriptively so that you know what the thing actually looks like. They're wooden skulls representing uh, deckhands. The more advanced version of this actually tells you what those components are going to be used for in the game. Uh, again, Tasty Minstrel is uh, uh, our, our role model for doing this. Uh, this is just a couple of the things that come in the Scoville, uh, uh, two sets of cards. So they're action cards, uh, I'm sorry, auction cards. Uh, you know there are 65 of them. Uh, you can already tell that they're divided into morning uh, cards and afternoon cards, and you know how many there are of each of those. Uh, you also know exactly what they're going to be used for. Players bid on these for extra peppers. Um, and there's also an indication for the information on the card, what is the relevant information. Uh, in this case, the stuff at the top and the stuff at the bottom is pretty much decoration. The key information are those colored peppers in the middle, which are the actual items up for auction. Similarly with the market cards, explains what the market cards are for, highlights the two areas of information on the cards, you know, what those are. These are the peppers that you need, the rewards, this is what you're going to get if you provide those peppers. Um, by doing that, you again tie into the theme what your components are for. You're also continuing to establish that foundation and provide the readers with kind of their building up, layering up an understanding of how the game works before you ever get to the first rule. And what that means is that when you do get to explaining the rules, your rules can be really very focused on that detailed step-by-step -step instructions for how you carry out the, the process. You don't need to stop and say, oh yes, okay, so now I'm going to explain this and this and this and this. Here's the explanation of it step out to the high view, explain this and this and this and this, back to the detailed view. Did you have a, was there a question? Yeah, I was just wondering about limits. Um, you know, I saw the overview, and the same thing with the card, like, details. You know, sometimes in games, the details on the card is quite big. Mm -hmm. Do you have, like, any kind of, like, general rule of don't describe every single thing on the card, because then you'll just confuse the person, right? Yeah, um, so I had a question about when is, how much is too much? Um, so if you have a game that has cards that have really a lot of information on them, uh, you don't necessarily want to go through every piece of uh, information, or technically the question is, how much is too much? Uh, and my answer to that would be, um, again, at this point, you're providing overview information. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna provide any specific rules uh, for any of this stuff. At the same time, I think you do want to say, look, this is my card. Yes, it's complicated. These are the five or, or heaven help us, ten bits of information that you're going to find on every card. Here's the cost up in the corner. Uh, here's an activation effect. Here's a defense strength. Here's an attack strength. Um, here's a class. Uh, here's a, a elemental uh, uh, affinity that it has. Um, I think you should show those cards and say, yeah, okay, there's a lot of information here. This is the information you're going to find on these cards. Maybe you don't even go in and explain, you know, 
cost is what you're going to have to pay to do that because you know cost is one of those things that people are going to immediately say okay this is my I spend something to acquire this um, attack strength and defense strength okay these cards are going to be in combat somehow um, but you should at least say this is a chunk of information that you're going to care about so that when you get to the rules about it the actual rules about it people are not saying oh the attack strength the cards have an attack strength where am I going to find that they say oh yeah right the cards have an attack strength oh yeah right the cards have a special ability that triggers when they're played oh yeah the cards have a ongoing ability I know that because I saw that earlier in the rules um, I am technically out of time uh, uh, but I think if there are some questions Sure, up here. I did have just a real brief question, and it shouldn't take you too long to answer it. it you used a lot of examples of like card games and board type mm -hmm. games. One of the things that I see in role playing games a lot is that standard, this is what a role playing game looks like. At what point does that just become cliche and unnecessary, or is there ever a point where you can do that out? Yeah, so the question has to do with um, rules for slightly more specialized games like role playing games. Um, and uh, we noted that a lot of role-playing games start out with a section about this is how role-playing games work um, and the question is is that does that at some point become unnecessary um, and I think the answer to that depends on who you think your audience is um, if you think you're selling your role-playing game to an audience that already understands role-playing games then yeah you don't have to have that in there um, but if you have aspirations to be kind of a gateway role-playing game, uh, then you should make sure that you've got some explanation in there about how role-playing games work because people may be encountering your rule book that have not played a role-playing game or have not, don't have a fresh concept in their mind about what role-playing games are and how they, how they work. Um, question in the back. Yeah. Um Sometimes it seems like when you're writing a rule book, you have a finite amount of real estate because of the printing and the number mm -hmm. of pages. Is there a, a, a sweet spot of, uh, you don't want it to be all text, but you want to show some diagrams, you want to show some cards. Is there a percentage like, all right, 60% text, 40% pictures, like how much is too much of either side? Uh, I, you gonna have something to say about that? I, I, I might uh, talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a little bit, but as far as actual numbers, yeah, uh, it certainly. On the game. Yeah. So the question uh, was um, working with a limited amount of real estate in 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 your rule book, a certain number of pages, size of pages. Um, how do you balance uh, images and text? Is there a kind of ideal percentage of images, diagrams versus text? Um, and we're fumbling around because there isn't really kind of a numerical ideal. Um, certainly you don't want to have a game rules that are all text uh, because that's A, not taking advantage of the different ways that people learn how to do things uh, and B, it will be alarming to people who aren't the sort of people who really love reading rules. Um, uh, and all of the stuff that I'm suggesting you put in here is really Sometimes it feels like stuff that you're adding on top of uh, the actual rules. A lot of times when we're writing rules, you know, I really want to get down this procedural information so that players will know how to play the game. And oh, if I have to add an introduction on that and an overview, that's a couple of paragraphs. And a list of components with pictures of the components, that's a whole page right there. Um, I really think those that introductory stuff is important to help understand the rules and so you should make space for that material but rules are such an individualized thing I mean there's lots of lots of reasons why you might uh, diverge from kind of the, the standard archetypal rules organization um, but basically what uh, my off-the-cuff advice would be Anytime you can show something happening in the game, put in a diagram for that. Um, and then 
write your rules around that. Um, and I know that our inclination is to use words first because those are the things, those are very easy to sit down. You can use words for anything. If you want to make an illustration, you have to stop, switch to a different software, get your assets. Um, but it's really, I think the, the well-written rules are important. Having pictures to accompany those well-written rules are equally, if not more important. Um, so there's not, a, not really a, a, a balance other than have enough illustrations to explain the game and enough words to explain the game and stop before you over explain the game. In the back. Um, do you ever think it's worthwhile to have definitions in the introduction that will simplify the rest of the rules? Or is it asking too much to expect the players to learn a vocabulary before you explain the game to them? All right, so the question is about, has to do with definitions. Uh, do you put those in the, in the introduction um, so that players are kind of forced to learn this vocabulary before they actually get to the rules? Um, or do you put them somewhere else? Um, and uh, as with the last question, I'm going to kind of punt on that. Uh, to a certain extent, it depends on how big a vocabulary you're trying to teach. Um, the list of components is great for teaching the nouns of your game. Uh, if you have concepts that are more verby or uh, adjective-y, uh, <laughs> those might be better put within the, within the rules proper, kind of. Um, even if, even if you put a good overview on your game, you're still going to kind of want to have overview elements, if it's a complicated game, within each section. So, if you have, especially if you have a combat-based game, when you get to that section, you're going to want to provide a little, little mini overview of how combat works. And that's probably a good place for introducing the terms that are relevant to combat. Um, uh, and then if you, if you do go that way, then probably a little, if it's extensive, then a glossary at the end of the rules so that if something comes up and I say, oh, this is, this is one of those special game terms, I don't remember exactly what it means, here's the glossary, that way I can find it uh, very quickly. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you.